Through July, a number of prominent Conservatives took to the streets to buy and persuade the Conservative membership to vote for them as the leader of the party and, of course, the Prime Minister. There were many of the big beasts on parade. Boris Johnson, Sajid Javid, Andrea Leadsom, I don't know, offence there at all. But the surprise package was Rory Stewart, who, of course, was within the Cabinet and did extremely well in those polls. But times have changed a bit for Mr Stewart now because he actually doesn't even find himself in the Conservative Party. But he is still MP for Penrith and the Border. And he's here to take your calls with Ring Rory. Mr Stewart, thank you for coming on. Good to see you again. Thank you, Nick. I have one question before we go to the first questions. Um, Only two people were there, and possibly a corgi. Boris Johnson is absolutely convinced that he did not mislead at the Queen. She is unlikely to comment. The corgi as well will give no comment. What do you think happened? Do you fear that Boris Johnson did mislead the monarch? Um, There's absolutely no way of telling, as you say, unless we waterboard the corgi. We're not going to be able to get the information here. Um, I think the... the It's just a vision coming to mind, (laughs) Mr Stewart. (laughs) Um, I think the the bigger question is how were ministers selling this? So uh, my mother, for example, who's a Brexit voter, as soon as it was announced, said, oh, yeah, brilliant, Boris has done this in order to get a Brexit deal through. But that wasn't what the ministers were out there saying. They were briefing that they were doing it in order to do a Queen's speech on knife crime. And I think that, in the end, is going to be the kind of stuff that will decide it for the Supreme Court, not necessarily the evidence, the corgi. I know you've already addressed addressed this with uh, the Sun newspaper, I read, but there's been the suggestion that one of uh, the prominent members of the 21 former Conservatives might seek to stand in Uxbridge to effectively cut Boris Johnson off at the knees. It's not going to be you, Mr Stewart. It's not going to be me because... I would feel that that would be, for me personally, feel a little vindictive because, yes, it's true, I could stand against Boris and Uxbridge and probably take enough votes, but not to win the seat, but to let Labour in and then you'd lose the Prime Minister. But I am a Conservative and I wouldn't want to take out a Conservative Prime Minister uh, on the eve of an election and that way I'd feel like a sort of, that would be a sort of kamikaze move. You don't support the tactic? Uh, It's certainly not something I'd want to do myself. But do you support the tactic? Well, I can understand why some people, if they felt very, very strongly and they weren't uh, uh, sympathetic towards the Conservative Party and they really wanted to, felt a very strong, um, that they wanted Boris to leave, that they might want to do that. But I'm not... No, but one of your merry band might. Well, I don't see who would do it at the moment, but I wouldn't rule it out that if somebody was very angry and they really felt strongly that Boris was the wrong Prime Minister, that they might consider doing it. But it's not something that I would want to do. Let's go to those calls. Clive is in Bexley Heath. Clive, you're through to Rory Stewart. Go ahead. Good morning to you. Yes, good morning. Hi, Nick. It's Clive, back from America, visiting my mother. Oh, right. Um, We spoke a while back. Hi, um, Rory. Fan of yours. At least I was until a recent couple of uh, decisions. I'm just wondering why you feel it's appropriate to vote against the man who was elected by the members of the party that you were a member of. Um, You ran against him, you lost. It seems that the honourable thing to have done would have been to abstain, not to vote against him. Um, There seems to be a habit these days of people participating in democracy, and then when they don't like the answers they get, uh, they turn around and try to undermine the results. And I'm afraid, having been a fan, that's kind of how I see the way you've acted against well, Boris Johnson. Stay on the line, Clive. Let's okay. let Mr Stewart so get I in. Think, Mr. Stewart. I think that's a very good question, a very good challenge, and it's one that I've had from people in my own constituency. So the way that I, I feel about it is this, that I had said consistently all the way through when I was trying to get a Brexit deal through, a Brexit deal, of course, which Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson and Dominic Raag voted against, which was the Brexit deal of my Prime Minister, which was Theresa May, which was a Brexit deal which was in accordance with my Conservative manifesto, that part of my manifesto commitment when I stood to be an MP was an orderly exit from the European Union. And I said that a no-deal Brexit wouldn't be that. I was clear for the last two years that I would never vote for a no-deal Brexit. I and many other colleagues voted against No Deal Brexit in the indicative votes. I said to Boris all the way through the leadership campaign, you're not going to be able to get a No Deal Brexit through Parliament because the majority of Parliament is against it. And I said to him in a personal conversation just the day before he took over, look, I understand you want to do this. You know that I disagree because we said this again and again when we were against each other in leadership. So I will resign from your cabinet because I understand that you want people in government who will vote for a no-deal Brexit. And that was the agreement we made. But at no moment did he think 
uh, or suggest that he would do something that even Mr. Thatcher would never have considered doing, which is trying to fire people as MPs for a disagreement on an issue like this. Quick response from you, Clive. Yeah, I, I mean, the honourable thing to have done, Rory, and I see you as an honourable man, would have been to abstain. I've been a council member. I've sat in chambers. You didn't have to vote against him. Um, and don't try and deflect by bringing up what he did afterwards. You caused that. So th- my question is a simple one. Why not just abstain? All right, because I wanted to prevent a no-deal Brexit. It would have been a very, very damaging thing for farmers in my constituency, for the car industry. It's unnecessary. We had a good deal on the table. And by the time I voted, it felt inevitable that unless I did something, we would have crashed out with a no-deal Brexit on the 31st of October, and abstaining would not have prevented that no-deal Brexit. Clive, thank you for that. You, you mentioned your constituency. I have a figure here that your constituency voted actually majority to leave, 55% to leave. Is that a figure you recognise? Absolutely. So, so I, they want to leave. They do. The country's voted to leave. Your own constituencies vote. I have to put it to you, how come you know better, Mr Stewart? I believe in leaving. I voted consistently for a Brexit deal. I was probably the number one strongest advocate for that Brexit deal, and I fought for it. But believing as I do in Brexit isn't the same as believing in a no-deal Brexit. There isn't a democratic mandate for a no-deal Brexit. The majority of my constituents do not want a no-deal Brexit. They want a sensible Brexit deal, particularly farmers in my constituency, do not want to be in a world where cheap food will come flooding in from Brazil, Argentina, and the United States, and will be locked out of Europe with 40-60% tariff barriers which will prevent us exporting that food. So they want Brexit but they don't want a no-deal Brexit. Let's go to Nam in Streatham. You're on the radio, Nam. Good morning. Good morning, hi. Good morning. Your question to Rory Stewart. Um, Rory, my question is why would you so hurriedly rule out joining the Lib Dems who are the only centrist party left in the UK on the national stage and I ask that as an ex-Tory voter who can no longer stand by while the Conservative Party becomes the English Nationalist Party. Well, this is the flip side of the question from the previous... Uh, from Clive. From yeah. Clive. Uh, so, I don't want a no-deal Brexit, but I also disagree with the Lib Dems. I don't want to revoke or remain. I'm not a Remainer. I believe in compromise. I believe in the centre ground. And for me, the centre ground is a Brexit deal. I think the danger of going down Clive's route of no deal or your Lib Dem route of remain and revoke is that you're going to divide the country for the next 40 years. We have to compromise, which means people who accept a no deal Brexit will have to accept a slightly closer relationship with Europe and people who voted remain will have to accept that we're leaving the European Union. Nam, a quick response from you. Um, tell me which party is standing up for that, and I would happily vote. Like I said, <laughs> I, I have been a Tory supporter all my life, um, and I'm a high-tax uh, uh, payer, um, yes. but I can't stand the racism that has taken over your party and thrown someone like you well, out of the well, party. Well, let's put that. Do, do you think there's racism in the Conservative Party, Mr Stewart? Um, I think in all these parties there are people, and this is not usually at the top of the party, but there are members with uh, very disturbing views. That's true of anti-Semitism of the Labour Party. It's true, unfortunately, of of Islamophobia in some parts of the Conservative Party. And I think uh, this is part of a general problem in politics, which is that our language is getting more and more divisive, more and more polarizing, more and more extreme. And that's true on immigration race. I think it's also true in the way that we're now talking about Parliament the way that we're now talking about judges. I think one of the reasons that I'm actually, at the moment, proud to be an independent member of parliament and stand for the centre ground is I think we need to be much more careful with our language. And part of being in the centre ground is more careful, decent approach. How careful was Speaker John Berker with his language yesterday when he likened the Prime Minister to a bank robber? Well, not not careful at all. I mean... (laughs) Look, I, I suppose. Are you critical well, of Mr. I, Burke? I suppose my my uh, yeah, I'm one of the strengths and also the challenges of being the centre ground in British politics is that I'm against these approaches from both sides. So I haven't liked some of the language that's come out of the prime minister. I'm afraid, and I don't like some of the language that comes out of the speaker. I don't want to feel that I'm living in the United States. I don't want this type of uh, dramatic. 
uh, aggressive language because what it does in the end is divide. It pits one person against another. I don't like the tone of the Brexit party. I don't like the tone of momentum. I don't like the tone of the speaker. I want a more dignified, polite approach to politics. But what's your future, Mr Stewart? Do you look forward to the time when you will be able to find your way in or they will be able to find a way for you to come back to the Conservative Party? I had been hoping for that and I... I'm somebody who's proud to be a Conservative and serve my constituents as a Conservative. I'm afraid at the moment, Nick, it's now looking less and less likely that I will be able to come back to the Conservative Party. They've taken the whip away from me, and mm. I feel the party is now moving, sadly, uh, towards an electoral strategy which seems to be aligning itself with the Brexit Party. I'm troubled by some of the language uh, that's coming out of some of the members and some of my colleagues, and so... I'm afraid I may find myself in a world that I actually have to run as an independent. So you would continue to seek to represent the good people of your constituency, but this time is that you'd fight against the Conservatives, you'd fight as an independent? I think I'm coming to the view now that I may have to run as an independent, not as a Conservative, yes. You've had no letters or soundings from anyone within Number 10 to see if we could find a way back, or build a bridge to bring you back? I received a, a letter, as did uh, many of my other colleagues from the Chief Whip, but the tone of the letter uh, was largely um, critical, saying that uh, that I had broken the rules and that the whip had been removed. So I, I think it's very difficult. If you think about it from the point of view of uh, Dominic Cummings and the Prime Minister, they have been pushing for a no-deal Brexit. They are trying to get traditional Brexit party supporters, particularly in the northeast of England, to support them. It'll be very difficult for them to bring people like me back into the party who are arguing for a more moderate compromise. Let's get Ed into the conversation. Ed, you're in lip, lip hook. Sorry, Ed in lip hook. Your question. Good morning. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask Mr Stewart, um, does he think that um, he should be forced to call a by-election in his constituency because he was elected in his constituency as a Conservative member and now he's no longer a Conservative member whether he should be forced to uh, call a by-election. What about mandatory by-elections for people such as yourself, or indeed others who change parties? Well, I, I think it's a very good question. I mean, I think... Uh, well, yes or no, Mr Stewart? Well, l l let me try to explain why it's complicated. From my point of view, I'd have no problem with that. I think, ironically, the people it? who would have a problem with it are the Conservative Party themselves. Right. And there's a further problem, which is that if it was mandatory, what would happen is that as soon as the whips were withdrawn effectively MPs would lose their seats. And the problem with that is that you would then have a world where there would be no independence for Parliament at all. As soon as an MP voted against the Prime Minister, they'd be fired overnight. Yes. What would be the point of Parliament? I mean, this is one of the reasons Mrs Thatcher didn't deselect people. Withdrawing the whip was supposed to be a temporary suspension, temporary disciplinary method. So, you know, Ian Duncan Smith lost the whip in the 1990s for a few months. But nobody tried to stop him running as a Conservative in his seat. If you do that, then you basically have robots or automatons as members of Parliament, because as soon as they vote against the government once, they've lost their seat. So I think it would be very dangerous for the Constitution if you gave the centre the power to fire MPs every time they moved against the centre. There'd be no point in Parliament But imagine, all. I hear you, and that's a very interesting argument, but imagine if you were living in Streatham and you elected someone as a Lek Chuka Amuna as a Labour candidate who then went to change, and he's now with the Lib Dems and he could be eyeing up the birthday party any time <laughs> soon. How would you feel if you were saying, that's ludicrous, isn't it? Well, I think there's a difference there. Chuka chose to leave the Labour Party. I, I didn't choose to leave the Conservatives. No. I wanted to be in the Conservatives. So, so I, if you I, choose to leave, you should have a you should have a by election. I tend to think that. Yeah, I think it's a matter for the individual. But yes, my instinct would be that if you break with your party and I choose see. to leave them, you should probably go to your constituents. Why was Boris Johnson such a bully to you and the other twenty? I think he calculated that he could clean out the one nation centrist part of the party. I mean, one of the interesting things is that. Uh, the vast majority, I think probably 18 of the 21 people he fired were my core leadership campaign team. So that this was the whole of the people who supported me for the leadership were knocked out in a single move. And so I think he hoped that he could clean out that whole side of the party and then use our vote as an excuse to hold an immediate election, take a bounce off that, and it would avoid him having to wait to the 31st of October, which would have been a problem for him because on the 31st of October, 
Right. Everything we predicted would have been clear, which is that he couldn't get a new deal from Brussels, he couldn't get a no deal yeah. through Parliament. So call an election in the middle of October and hopefully win a majority. So you, you are the key man. Are you a cricket man, Mr Stewart? I'm not a cricket man. Oh, so it's saying it's like bowling Steve Smith out for zero wouldn't mean anything to you at all. And not really as a Scot, <laughs> I'm afraid. No, okay. that doesn't really. <laughs> Mike Dennis was a Scot, and he was a very good England captain at one point. We move on. Kieran's in Canterbury. Uh, and Mike Dennis was a Kent player. Right, Kieran, your question to Rory Stewart. Good morning. Morning. Um, yeah, my question is: uh, last week there was a bit of there was a fair bit of hype around this uh, Boris Johnson talking in front of the police. Um, college and uh, oh yes up in I think it was Wakefield yes yes yeah that's it Wakefield um, and so to, to Rory uh, I I was keen to know your views on that I think you need to be pretty careful doing that stuff I was the prisons minister and uh, I was very clear with prison governors and with the prison service that I wouldn't try to use prisons as backdrops for doing party political stuff because these are uniformed services. They're important institutions of the state. And I think we need to be very, very respectful towards police officers, prison officers, civil servants, because otherwise you put them in an embarrassing position. They're put in a position of looking as though they're endorsing a particular party political position, and they're not allowed to be party political. So he was wrong to do it? I think he was wrong to let the speech go in that direction. If he'd kept the speech talking about new funding for the police, the police would have been perfectly happy, and I think that's what they were expecting. Rory, thank you. Pat in Dundalk in Ireland. Hello, Pat, go ahead. Good morning, sir. Good morning to you. Um, my, my question is, uh, my main fear is that if there is an old deal Brexit, there will be a return to a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Does Rory agree with me that Hopefully there will be a deal, and if it, there is a deal, it will in, include a Northern Ireland-only backstop. Yeah. Because the people in Northern Ireland, in, in all fairness, not every one of those people were asked. The DUP have their opinion, and I'm sure the people in Northern Ireland have a different opinion to that. Well, I completely agree with you that um, a hard border in Ireland would be very destabilising. That I felt when I was in Derry, Londonderry, and in Enniskillen, how recent and in some ways, sadly, how fragile the peace uh, in Ireland is. I was very struck in Derry, London, Derry, by the fact that the parachute regiment flags were still up, that you got a sense of communities still uh, in a very, very tense relationship with each other, with the Apprentice Boys parades and things. And it's very clear to me, with the border there on three sides, with 85% of sheep from Northern Ireland going to abattoirs in the Republic, with an all-island health economy, that if you begin to draw that border more strongly, you cause a problem. And that problem is that the whole basis of the Good Friday Agreement is, of course, that people are able to have different identities in Northern Ireland. You can feel Irish, you can feel British, but you don't have to worry too much about which you are because there isn't a border. Put that border back in, and then I'm afraid I am concerned. I'm concerned for the economy, but more than that, I'm concerned for politics in Ireland. Pat, response? Yeah. Well, look, to be honest with you, I'm, I was listening to uh, Greg Hand speaking in the Houses of Parliament last week. He was speaking to Boris Johnson, and indeed he was on LBC there with Thomas Walberg the night before. And he was speaking about this Alternative Arrangements Commission, and he was saying there was no need to have a backstop. However, he did say that it would take three years to implement. I mean, the, the bottom line is, you know, if it's going to take three years, and we're so confident it's going to take three years Surely there should be no problem putting in a Northern Ireland backstop in the meantime. I couldn't agree more. So if you're, and this is, of course, the point about the backstop, the backstop only comes in if the alternative arrangements don't work. So if people are confident that their alternative arrangements will work, then there's no reason not to accept the backstop. Pat, thank you for that. Related to this, you'll be aware, and possibly you've had sight of some newspaper reports, there's a possible lifeline on the way to the Prime Minister from the DUP, as it appears to be agreeing to shift its red lines in a move to unlock a Brexit deal, concerning it except a Northern Ireland abiding by some EU rules after Brexit. Do you think we're effectively going to go back to have a Theresa May deal plus that might get through? I very much hope we do. I mean, as somebody who argued very strongly that the Theresa May deal was a good deal, it was a much better deal than people acknowledge, that it, its big achievement was that it got Europe to do what people thought Europe would never do, which was give you control over immigration, but also allow you frictionless access to the European market. So we get back there. I'd be very happy. I, I think I can speak comfortably for almost all the 21 others that we would all vote for that deal. 
The problem, however, is that uh, the numbers in Parliament have always been tricky for a version of Theresa May's deal. And people will say, look, you brought it forward three times. Now, I hope things have changed. I hope people realise how impatient the public are, how much they want to move on, and that this time people are going to stop making the best the enemy of the good and they're going to vote for that deal and get it done. Do we and take, I wish we'd done it on the 31st of March. Do we take heart from this, this sounding from the DUP? I'm afraid that it's a long way between what they're saying at the moment and what you'd need to get a deal through, because what they're saying at the moment is that, yes, they'd accept some things, but it's a long way short of what you'd need to avoid a border in Ireland. You're getting some rave reviews on the text, tweets and emails. This is uh, Michael, the best Conservative politician by miles, says Michael Jeb. I'm listening to Rory Stewart, and somehow the Conservatives voted in Boris Johnson. They must all be mad. There's people enjoying your appearance. Let's go to another caller. Jeff's in Havant. Jeff, you're on the radio. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, average pay is up. Unemployment is down. Why are you so afraid of Brexit? Rory Stewart. Partly because I'm not afraid of Brexit. I'm afraid of a no-deal Brexit. I think if we get a Brexit deal, actually, things will be very good. If we land a good Brexit deal, like the withdrawal agreement, like Theresa May's Brexit, I predict that we will have a real economic boom. There are a lot of investors who've been holding back who will come in. I think our currency will recover and we'll have a real bounce. And I think we'll have, if we're lucky, three, four years of good economic performance, which will allow us to spend money on health and education. And in fact, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, will be in a very, very lucky situation. And people like me will apologise to him because he will have got a deal through. And I'll wish him all the best of luck in, in running a country with a good economic performance. The problem with the no-deal Brexit, though, is that it creates all those problems that you will be familiar with for our motor industry, for farmers. And if we put tariffs up, as we'll have to, it will lead to more expensive goods in our shops. That will squeeze household incomes. And I, all the other things you know about inflation will go up, interest rates will go up, household incomes will decline, and there'll be less money to spend on public services. Quick response, Jeff, in a sentence from you. Basically, I think that so long as the EU know that we're willing to leave without a deal, they're going to try for a deal. I disagree with that, because you are not frightened by no deal. Right? So if Europe threatened you with no deal, it wouldn't change your position much, would it? So why do you think Europe would change their position in the other direction? Quick, quick response, Jeff, because I'm a bit tired on uh, Rory is pulling the rug from under Boris Johnson's feet. So the only way in which no deal would work as a threat is if Europe was generally frightened by no deal. But the truth of the matter is that Britain does about over 40% of its exports to Europe. Europe does only about 6% of its exports to Britain. So it would be like negotiating with a company for one of their subsidiaries in which they had only 6% of their money and threatening to blow that up as a negotiation. But what you is can the £39 get... billion, pounds, some would argue, Mr Stewart? It's not enough money to shift them as far as you want. Of course it has an influence, and that's why we got, with Theresa May's deal, some movement out right. of Europe. But there's a limit to how much movement you can get with that kind of threat, and we've reached the limit of that. And we've almost reached our time. The Operation Yellowhammer Papers, are they an indication, a prediction, or a worst-case scenario? There, um, as far as I can see, a base case scenario. In other words, I, I was in the cabinet when those documents were first being prepared, and we understood it in the cabinet time. And that's me, that's David Gork, that's Philip Hammond, that's all of us, as being our best understanding of what would happen if we went to a no deal Brexit. And that is the reason why so much of uh, the old cabinet is horrified at the idea of a no deal Brexit and has been voting to stop it. You have an important appointment to make, I understand, after this. Where is it you have to go now? I have now got to go to the US Embassy to get a visa because um, I, uh, when I was an MP, used to travel to places like Libya and Iraq and Iran. I was in, uh, I was in Libya just a day after Gaddafi fell, and that means that I can't go to the United States with an Esther. <laughs> And you don't have your ministerial visa. And I don't have that anymore. So you're going to be queuing with the great and good to get your visa to go to the United States. That's right. I exactly. won't get in your way. Will you come and do Ring Rory again with us soon when you get safely back from the United States? I'd love to, Nick. Thank you very much. Happy landings to you, Rory Stewart, Thank appearing you. here Bye. on LBC, where news is next. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This...